how's it growing? One of the biggest challenges in our South Florida gardening is this invasive reptile. You may have seen the previous iguana episode, and you can consider this as an update. The Tropical Flowering Tree Society had me speak about this and other invasive animals at the renowned Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Miami. So let's get right to it. How's it growing? <laughs> Does this hibiscus look familiar? Have you seen hibiscus all chewed up like this? Yeah. This, this was the first time that we, now we, we bought our house in Oakland Park in the Fort Lauderdale area, um, 2011. We were blessed that we had not had any iguanas until about five years ago. Let's take a step back before we dive into this. I want to give a little inspiration. Rick Clark, not Dick Clark, that's how I remembered his name. He is so inspiring to listen to because he not only, now he's a, a fifth generation farmer in Indiana who changed his 7,000 acre farm not only from conventional to organic, but took it a step further to reg regenerative agriculture. And so inspiring to listen. He's become an evangelist for the regenerative movement. And uh, one of my favorite saying of his is, nature will humble you at every turn. Nature will, I don't care how much experience in gardening, growing veggies or flowers, you have, there's, nature always has another lesson for us to learn. And then we learn from each other. I learned from Greg on Facebook, and I'm so glad to finally meet him tonight in, in person after, <laughs> I don't know, a couple of years at least. Uh, but we, we come together, we learn from each other, but then every day in the garden, le nature has another lesson for us and another way to humble us. Regenerative agriculture, the two things that, now it's very similar to permaculture, and there's a lot of overlap. So if you're not familiar with regenerative, it's a different scope and focus than permaculture has, but it's basically you know, a lot of the same principles. The focus in regenerative is soil health and the health of the ecosystem. What I'm about to show, how, how that translates from Indiana to South Florida. This is James Pike. If you've been watching my channel, you've seen we did a uh, food forest tour up in Jupiter. Amanda wrote a book on having food forests and transforming Florida yards is what it's called. They're all about permaculture. One thing that we kind of embraced is that, you know, we love these chimethos, but the squirrels are going to get some of them. And so if you have enough abundance of them and you're just growing them, first of all, plant choice is important. So some plants are just not going to make it. And the ones that don't make it, if the pests get them, if the bunnies eat all of them, maybe that's not the right plant to grow there. But if there's enough of them in terms of volume, and they're the type of plant that they don't get completely demolished by whatever pests are out there, like white flies or you know any kind of bugs, that you can enjoy them, then those are the plants for us. you know. And we try to grow them in, in enough volume that we can appreciate it and not try to get too stressed out. You know, when I started the YouTube channel, I, I gave my friend Cynthia Schaefer um, a, a series on the, on the channel and we were bringing two different approaches to organic gardening. She's hardcore when it comes to sustainability. Her motto is, what would the forest do? And I was still using, you know, sprays, uh, BT, neem oil, and that was my organic uh, approach. But I hardly use neem, I very rarely use neem oil, and once, I'm much more careful about using BT. Some strains of BT can kill larvae that we don't want to kill. <laughs> So I'm much more careful about that. As you see these on the screen, I'm curious, raise your hand if you've seen this in your garden and I wanna know if it's done damage in your garden. Does anyone has, has citrus? Yeah, citrus greening, it's awful. And it's been devastating. It's devastated the Florida citrus industry I mean, how iconic is the Florida orange and it, what, what happened to it? 
the hammerhead flatworm. Yeah. Has it done damage though? No. Okay. But you know to how to kill it, not to chop it up because it will. So if you chop it, it will regenerate into multiple worms. So you got to squish the whole thing or put it in a Ziploc bag. And, but if that Ziploc bag gets punctured in the trash, it will squeeze out of that hole. Jumping worm. I, need to, I want to dig into more research on that and, uh, and do a video on that. That's, I think, a really interesting topic. Feral hogs or wild boars? Nobody? Okay, I did. You have? No, I've seen them on both times. Okay. I don't think there's such a problem in, in urban settings. Okay. But then, are there any others that, you, besides iguanas? Python. Okay. All right. Before I forget, so when I'm wearing a cowboy hat on the YouTube channel, that's kind of my alter ego. He morphed into a separate character over how to pronounce nematode because a lot of people, you know, the soil parasite. I have a whole series on nematodes on the YouTube channel. It just makes things a little more interesting when my alter ego is may maybe correcting me or has brings a different point of view rather than me just sharing the information. Like I said, I hadn't seen any iguanas until, boy, it looks fluorescent on this screen. <laughs> All the colors are oversaturated on the screen. <clears throat> but I was up on the roof cleaning our gutters and out from the uh, elderberry bush comes this iguana coming out and just slowly move in my direction and just I think he was just as curious about me as I was about him and I just took in this moment just for a couple of minutes just staring at it and just thinking you're beautiful but wow your species is doing so much damage to our ecosystem the Florida Fish and Wildlife because of the, the detriment that it's, it's having on the ecosystem, they're encouraging residents to humanely kill the iguanas. And if, if you wanna, I'm not gonna get into that, into that but if you, if you look up, it's easily Googled, the Miami Herald, the Sun Sentinel have articles on the internet on how, oh, and even the Florida Fish and Wildlife that one gets, if you read through that, that is gruesome. Tonight, I'll go over some different techniques. And one thing about regenerative gardening or regenerative agriculture is context. So your context in your garden might be completely different from Greg's or Frank's, Mike. Maybe some of the, the things that I talk about in, in techniques, you're gonna be like, hell no, I can't, that's not feasible for me. But then Greg, oh yeah, I could do that. So I'll have a, a bunch of ideas, but the objective, my goal, is that you'll leave here with a hopeful feeling of being able to protect your garden from iguanas. Uh, so we'll go over barriers and garden beds, deterrence and repellents. One reason why there's such a problem is not only the fact that a female can lay 14 to 76 eggs in a clutch, but they, their longevity, they can live 20 to 30 years. And there are no natural predators in an urban, urban setting. However, Tonight, Greg tells me that he has seen um, some sort of hawk, a cooper hawk, okay, um, kill an iguana. So that's hopeful. Probably see it, right? Yeah, not in a nervous. I hope. I hope they're not in a nervous setting. 
So, barriers. You could put up an electric fence, but once again, you know, that may not be feasible for you, right? No one's, I don't know anyone who's willing to go that to that extreme, but that's an option. Any veggie gardeners here? Okay. So let's talk about barriers for veggie garden boxes. Now let's head over to the Urban Farming Institute, just a mile away from here in Oakland Park. UFI is dedicated to inspiring and educating gardeners, scientists, students, farmers, and youth. Throughout the garden, there's various methods to protect from iguanas, um, and some of our gardeners have chosen a, a more harder plastic, a wraparound, and we're finding that this type of protection um, is a little too sturdy for the iguanas, meaning they will climb it, then they will get in. So at UFI, we've uh, done a lot of studies and a lot of experimenting on iguana prevention. What we found, really what the most effective is, is the, the bird netting. And this is a good application of the bird netting. We found at least four feet high is, is completely effective. But the important thing about the bird netting is that it has to be loose, it can't be taut, and it also needs to be doubled because the fear the iguana has of being entrapped in the netting is what's, what the prevention is. And so this is a good application of it. It's the right height. This, this garter has gone a little bit over and they have a cover on it. That's fine. That's probably more for shade. But what doesn't really work is you do have bird netting here, but you can see, you know, it's just one strand and it's not gonna be as big of a prevention as having the double strand and make sure it's loose. But of course, when you surround your bed with bird netting, the question is, how do you get into it? How do you maintain it? So what I came up with was a system made out of bamboo where the top rail drops down. And by doing that, it gives you full access around the bed. You can do the same system with uh, PVC. This is a common material that we see in the garden. And we see this on uh, just in several beds that are within here. It is not a material that we would recommend for iguana prevention. It's, it's too thick, they can easily climb on it. Uh, if there's enough air gap under the bottom, then it, they will actually go through the bottom. This gardener's being successful with it because he's gone with a full canopy and really trying his best to make this a, a sealed off enclosure. The simplest method to prevent iguanas is the use of bird netting doubled over at a height of four feet and make sure that the material is left loose and billowy. And this is a really strong inhibitor and very effective. So for our, our vertical growing system, our hydroponic system, we did have issues with iguanas. And one of the main reasons uh, we had issues with iguanas climbing the towers is because of our catch buckets at the bottom. So the bottom bucket was used as leverage for the iguanas to climb and then eat the vegetables um, in, the, in the tower. And you can see this bucket here has a lot of scrapes in it from the iguanas. So what we did was we removed the black buckets from, from the towers, uh, from the catch bottom part of the, of, of the pole. Uh, we removed a bucket, uh, a fourth bucket. Um, so this actually will keep the iguanas, the iguanas can't reach to climb up. I was also impressed with what I found at the Southwest ranches. Here, the Rare Fruit and Vegetable Council of Broward built these durable cages that you can easily lift off for planting, garden maintenance, and harvesting. They use zip ties to secure the barrier to the PVC framing. Or you could use bamboo instead of PVC. Sure, but this bamboo might be a bit too big. You could use chicken wire or at least something with holes big enough for the pollinators to go through. I just had to throw in that gratuitous bamboo shot from Costa Rica. I was so impressed with that, that huge bamboo. And Greg tonight confirmed something that I was, a point I was going to make with, with uh, the bird netting. But you use deer, um, deer netting. Deer netting. It's a, it's a it basi so basically it's the same type of thing. And you were saying that uh, it was a black snake that was caught in it. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, possums and snakes can get caught in this and, and that snake died trying to get out of it. A good alternative, tool fabric. I hear that that works much better with, without jeopardizing snakes. Dogs are actually really good deterrents for, uh, you know, if you have a dog, maybe the dog should go to the backyard a lot more often, <laughs> right? 
Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that uh, cats can too. So we have cats. We, <laughs> we have more cats than I care to admit, but we, we love our cats. <laughs> this is Kiki. She patrols the garden boxes when it's convenient for her. They'll use the garden boxes? I have a video about that. I, I have a video on keeping, right, well, deterring. So a deterrent, here's another, another point. These deterrents are not 100% effective, but a combination of deterrents is going to be more effective. So I, I have a video about deterring raccoons and the cats. I built a sandbox for Kiki and Mo and but Kiki loves her sandbox. This is Jeffrey Davey. He is an owner of a nursery up in, up in Broward. One of our biggest challenges when we first opened were iguanas because we carry a lot of iguana loving plants. So we went to the Humane Society and since we've had the cats, we have not seen one iguana. No sign of iguanas, uh, cats patrol the property all day long. We have them inside at night and it has worked like a charm. And that's my Gigi or three-legged and my beautiful Kiki and Mo asleep. Come on, wake up, Mo. We have very thick landscaping, so often the iguanas will go unnoticed by the cats or maybe the cats are sleeping. So that's why there's, there's another, there's actually repellent that I use that helps with, with uh, some of that. Some people say pinwheels help. I have not try that. I don't know how effective that is, but the Florida Fish and Wildlife say that hanging CDs and wind chimes help. I, I would just be, just, you know, be courteous to your neighbors, you know, don't go hang it. I wouldn't go hanging CDs in the front yard. <laughs> it's just not very pretty. <laughs> And then I know someone who can't stand their neighbors uh, hanging chimes. So it's an idea though. Uh, now this, this guy, Brian, he was supposed to be here tonight. Um, but if you need his, he's a, he's a catcher. He also has tree wraps that he installs that are transparent. Brian Rosado, who services South Florida, has this product that prevents iguanas from climbing trees. And it's one of our tree wraps. This tree wrap over here, you can barely see it, but it's uh, wrapping this palm tree and uh, nullifying the ability for iguanas and rats to climb up into the canopy and uh, destroy whatever uh, foliage you have on your property. It's durable. It's not going to last two to three months. This is going to be a six to eight year product. So also that shot of me with the cowboy hat and the big iguana, that's the thumbnail for that video. You can easily find that on my website or the YouTube channel. Um, his contact information is in the description below of that video. How, how do they make it? Like, how do you keep it? Because if you put anything on the outside, do they glue it or how do they attach it? I honestly don't know. He has a way of attaching it. I, I don't know, uh, but a friend of mine, it was his backyard where I, I filmed that and he was happy with the product. And he, he actually recommended this guy to me to use for the video. Repellents. Has anyone used any of the repellents? Okay, which one did you use? I don't know. One was one sort of like cinnamon. One was updated pot peppers. Yeah, I mean, I know about that. Yes. Okay. I'm, I don't have any product uh, or brand deal with this, this company at all, uh, but has anyone tried Iguanagon? No. Okay. There are some downsides to using this, and that includes, it stinks. It stinks so bad. It's pricey. This was about $70. So I use it sparingly. And actually, I really think that the iguanas will get used to it if you use it all the time. So I cycle off of it. And then when iguanas become a problem again, I'll start to use it again. 
but I bought this like two years ago and I've only gone through that much. So the cats are really helping. Does it repel cats? <laughs> no, no. It's not 100% effective. And you must reapply after a rain, which, you know, in the summertime when it's raining, it's, you know, so much. You could go through a lot of this. All right, so my website, Stacks Urban Harvest. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. You saw clips of that previous episode on iguanas. If you want to see the full episode, you should see a link up here or find a link in the description. A special thank you to Frank of the Tropical Flowering Tree Society for contacting me about giving this presentation. You ready, Bo? Live regeneratively and let's grow together. Mm -hmm.